Let me uh, let me get a couple of clipboard items started around. The top one has been around a few weeks, but if you missed it, if you are going to attend the seniors' luncheon this Tuesday, all right, day after tomorrow, would you please sign up? We always like to make sure we have plenty of food that day. Uh, and a correction in the time of what you saw up there. It's going to start at 1130, all right, probably 1130 to 130. Might fudge a little on that. Uh, we've got a lot in for you. Since it's Easter month, we've got a lot planned for you. There's going to be communion besides lunch, so you'll, you'll get to eat twice. All right? Uh, one will satisfy your soul. The other one will satisfy your tummy. All right? And uh, there's also going to be some games and activities afterwards that you will enjoy. And you can have, uh, you can participate in the act of generosity by giving to uh, a missions organization or ministry organization in town. So if you're going to be attending, would you please sign up? And remember, it starts at 1130. Also on the clipboard is there's going to be a motorcycle ride next Sunday. The weather is beautiful out there. It should be great for that. And um, I just pulled it out. They're going to be going to Woodlake after the 8 o'clock service. So the way this works is you sign up, you show up on your motorcycle for the 8 o'clock service, and then you all leave after that service is over. And they're going to be going to Woodlake, and they are going to be eating at the restaurant at the airport in Woodlake. I bet most of y'all didn't even know there was an airport in Woodlake, did you? <laughs> it's not very big. All right, it isn't, but I will tell you, it's called the Runway Cafe, and it is worth the drive. Uh, I discovered it just a couple of months ago, and uh, had a great breakfast there. So, hope you guys will enjoy that. So, sign up because they want to make sure they have enough room for everybody. And then, Angel Tree Football Camp is coming up the first Saturday of May, May the fourth, uh, and they need volunteers to help with that. You don't have to know anything about football, uh, but if you just love kids and want to make a difference, sign up. They'll let you know uh, what it is that you can do. So there are three signups on each clipboard. Let me add my thank you to the thank you that Teddy gave you. Uh, first off, about your work day. Thank you for how many of you showed up and all the work that you got accomplished. We are so very, very grateful. Even though I couldn't be here this year, I'm grateful that you were here. So thank you for all that you did. I also want to say thanks for all of you who once again stepped to the plate to help families in time of crisis this past week. We had two memorial services, Thursday and Friday. There were desserts and food that needed to be brought. You all rallied to the call. We needed setup, servers, and cleanup, and you all did a great job, and so thank you. Uh, we have another service today, but it's not here, and we have another service Thursday. So if you'd just be praying for all of these families, I know they would appreciate it so very, very much. And my last thank you I want to share with you today, since I wasn't here last Sunday, is a huge thank you for the success of our pie auction. Two weeks ago, we all met here on a Sunday evening, had our annual fundraiser that we do for our Youth Mexico Mission Project. Our kids will be leaving this coming Saturday for a week of work and ministry in Mexico, and uh, we needed to raise the funds for the project as we do every year. And uh, let me tell you what, it was a record-setting night in every way. It was the largest attendance ever, all right? It looked about like this, okay? It, the house was full. So many wallets, made light work, all right? So thank you for all of you showing up. Number two, it's the largest amount of money we've ever raised on a mission night. Uh, we raised $27,000, all right? Our goal was 20. As we have shared, if we, if, if, if we raise more than what is needed, the leftover funds get used in one of two ways. Either other missions projects, we don't have to come back and ask you to give again, and or uh, other youth projects. And we're involved in a youth project right now over in the bridge. We're trying to spruce up their room, all right, for our, our young people because we use it so much for other things. It needed a little facelift, and so we are, uh, we are helping them with that. Uh, so thank you, and... Uh, it was also a record night for how many items were brought to the event. Usually it's 100 to 120. I finished in about an hour and 30 minutes. Uh, at two hours with no break, we still had a table full of items. And I found out later that night it's because over 200 items were brought for us to auction. So thank you, thank you, thank you for all that you do. Your generosity is amazing. Uh, please come back tonight for the service at 5 o'clock. Uh, 
Corey Gallardo is going to be delivering the message this evening, and she always brings it to the house. So looking forward to that. Uh, please take note of the Easter Sunday times. Your time is normal, but if you want to come to the early service, that's at 745. If you're an early riser, uh, come out because that'll, be, that'll have the most room in it. All right, 9, 15, 11 o'clock. There'll be packed houses probably. I hope it's overflowing. We will have overflow set up uh, in the other room. And just to note to our regulars, if you show up on Easter Sunday at this service or the later service and you see we are bulging at the seams, why don't you volunteer to go over, all right, to the overflow area and leave room for our guests that day, all right? We know the Cheesters are going to show up, Okay. For those of you who don't know what Cheesters are, that's the Christmas and Easter crowd, all right? And so we know they'll be here, and it's okay. We want them, all right? Chance for them to discover what this is all about. So give them those seats and head on over there if you see that we're getting impacted. We also have a good Friday service. Mark just knocked it out of the park last year. I can't wait to see what he's got in mind for us this year on What If. Let me highlight just a few prayer requests. Um, as you know, Dan Sullivan is going through uh, chemo treatment, and uh, he's at a certain stage now to where he and uh, his bride are going to be making a trip to Stanford and talking to uh, all the brains there about what the next best steps are. And so please be praying for that. I know they are, uh, they're, they're, there's a sense of excitement of what they've got to share with them. Uh, Jim Lindbergh from our church is not here today. Normally he would be, but he spent a few days in Kaiser Hospital this week, and he's home recuperating. David James is here this week. Uh, he had, uh, he's got a big scar, all right, down one side of his neck. He had a carotid artery addressed uh, so that he can have a more significant surgery this coming week on his back down in Southern California. So please be praying for him as he heads for that, uh, that, that surgery and then his recovery. And then Reba, uh, Reba Chamberlain, uh, part of our 8 o'clock crowd, but's not been able to be with us for about eight months now. She's broken two <laughs> hips. Three months apart, recovering from that, and now she is, we're waiting for the time and date this week. She's going to have to have her gallbladder removed. She turns 94 today, all right? 94 today. And uh, she has outlived all of her family. And so uh, I stopped by on the way uh, in this morning, and uh, she, she thinks she's up to lunch today. She wants a little Mexican food. So uh, we're going we're gonna to get her out for her 94th birthday today. So uh, I do have some cards. If any of you know Reba, Shelly has a couple of cards up here. If you want to write a note, just catch us after the service. And uh, you can put a quick note in a card if you would like to. All right, those are all of our, uh, all of our updates. I, you know what? I need to tell you one more story. Um, this is the way God works. We did, the memorial service on Thursday was for Ron Cross. Ron is a good friend of Barry and Teddy from our church. Um, Ron Cross has been in out of a Bible study, and, and he showed up at church three weeks ago. And that day, if you were here, you realize I, I gave an invitation at the end of the service, a chance for people to invite Christ to life. I, I didn't have them come forward, but I did ask for a, a raise of hand. And I said, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't embarrass you. I wouldn't come to you. And I had it with everybody's heads. I had two people raise their hand in that one service. And one of them was Ron Cross. Um, gave his life to Jesus Christ. Had a chance to talk about it with him because he invited me to talk with him about it just a few days later. And uh, he said, Tim, I know I'm headed for a serious surgery and it's not because I'm scared. Uh, but he said, I've postponed too long inviting Jesus Christ in my life. I've known about him. I've believed in him. I just never made the step. But he said, I did that Sunday morning. Prayed with him the day before he had surgery. He was at perfect peace. Um, what I didn't know about all that was the backstory. Um, his wife says, I'm not at the same place my husband is in my faith journey. But I really felt like what he was facing, he needed. So she called Barry and said, invite him back to Bible study that he used to go to with you. I get a text saying, why don't you invite him to church on Sunday? I'm afraid if I take him, he's going to think, oh, you're only doing this because you're scared for me. And so those were the background stories to Ron giving his life to Christ, fully expecting the surgery they were going to do was going to buy some more time from him. But instead, he went to heaven. And at his service, which had about this many people in it, the place was packed, a few chairs down the side, I told his spiritual story. 
I don't do this often. If I, at every funeral I do, folks know how they can have a relationship with Jesus. Sometimes it's a smaller version, sometimes it's a bigger version, but they can always leave and find, find Jesus on their own. But that, that Thursday, this last Thursday, at the end of Ron's service, I actually asked them to do the same thing I had done that Sunday a few weeks ago. I asked everybody to bow their heads, and I said, if, if you've heard Ron's story, and you say it's time that his story became your story, then pray this prayer with me. And I led in a prayer, and I asked them to do the same thing we did here that Sunday. I said, I want everybody to keep your heads bowed, everybody keep your eyes closed. But I said, if you, if you did what Ron did a few weeks ago, you invited Jesus in your life for the very first time, I just later in the week want to give thanks for what happened today. Would you just raise your hand, put it back down. Right here on the front row, the sister of his wife, hand up, down, right here, the best friend, the only person besides a family member who spoke on the platform that day from Delano. Can any good thing come out of Delano? Yeah, yes, 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 yes. And, and his hand went up and right back down, and afterwards he talked to me about the choice that he made. You, you see, heaven is rejoicing. It is this is a biblical principle that all things work together for good. What happened to Ron was not a good thing. But because he loved God, God took the all things, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and he brought something better out of an ugly situation. And God does that again and again and again to those of us who love him. And I just thought that was such a cool, cool story. I had to share it with you. Thank you. And, and, and guys, you make that possible by your willingness to serve, to set up, to provide resources for those services when they're held here. You make a difference in the lives of those families. So thank you. I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward, wait on us as we have our morning tithes and offering. And uh, would you join with me as we pray? Father, I thank you for the life that you share with us. You are available 24-7 to walk through this adventure that we call life. And you long for the moments when we will give you our lives 24-7. We kind of give it to you an hour today and maybe a couple of more hours on another day. And when we know we're facing trouble, another hour. But God, you long for this to be a full-time relationship with you. It's what you did on the cross for us. So you gave, you gave and did everything that's necessary so we can have that kind of intimacy with you. Father, thank you for the message from music that you will challenge and encourage us with today. Thank you for the challenge from your word that you have for us. I hope we will have the ears to hear your voice as you speak to us. Thank you for the privilege of giving and sharing. And Father, I just say thank you for these men and women who, who have, have given over these past few weeks for our special needs with our high school program and our youth mission outreach. And Lord, we pray for our kids as they're in the final week of preparation to go. And we thank you in advance for all you're going to do in and through them. Lord, for this and so much more, we give you thanks and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. For those of you who have joined us today, maybe for the very first time, and maybe it's been a long time since you've been in church, um, those concluding words are what this is all about. If it wasn't for the fact that Jesus Christ was alive today, there would be no such thing as Sunday morning worship. There wouldn't be such a thing as a church. There wouldn't be such a thing as hope in the midst of death and peace in the midst of trouble. And um, maybe this is your God wink moment. This may be your divine appointment when this is the time in which you can say, hey, maybe I've always believed there was a Jesus, but I've never made it personal. I trust today you'll do that. You don't have to wait for an end of a sermon. You don't have to wait to step forward in a service like some came just to pray and share needs this morning. You can come to the altar of your heart. Scripture says Jesus stands at the door and knocks and he's waiting to be invited in by you into your life. And all he's waiting for is your invitation. 
And so in the quietness of a moment in church, in a drive home from church, after you get home from church, you can invite him to come live in your life. For those of you who are believers, if all is not well in your world, you've been trying to do this whole Christian journey on your own, you need to confess. Because <laughs> God said, I never intended you to live the Christian life out of your own work, effort, and good deeds. I intended for you to live it in the full reality of dependence upon me. Make it right with him today. If you... Uh, if you have your Bibles and you want to turn to Luke chapter 19, I'll be reading a couple of verses from there in a few moments. Anybody watch March Madness yesterday? Final four? All right, yes, everybody did. Uh, did any of you watch, uh, you, you, you had four opportunities to watch the one-hour preview. Anybody watch the preview? You could have watched it four times or you could have watched it just once, but they did a preview. It's, a, it's the hype to the big moment. Well, I would like to tell you that Today is the hype for the big moment for the next two weeks, all right? Uh, we want to get a preview of what this whole thing of Easter is all about, all the way from Palm Sunday to Easter Sunday. So today's the warm-up for next week, okay? Um, there was a young fellow named John. I don't know if you've ever noticed, but almost in any story, there's always a boy named John in it, all right? And um, we certainly know that this is not a story about John Longstaff because I said a young fellow named John. <laughs> he was in the 8 o'clock service and so I said it in front of him as well. But a young fellow named John had purchased movie tickets for his girlfriend and himself. And while he was in line getting popcorn, she went on in to find their seats. By the time that he got his popcorn and his Coke, the previews were already starting to be shown and the theater was dark. As he fumbled his way into the auditorium, he sat down, leaned over, and gave his girlfriend a kiss. Right after that, he heard a very familiar voice from behind him say, John, I'm back here. <laughs> now, mistakes are inevitable in life, but there is a difference between making a mistake and being a failure. Today, what we want to do is preview Easter, hopefully preventing the ultimate failure of Easter week, and that is the betrayal of Jesus Christ in our own life. Luke chapter 19 is the story of Jesus uh, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached the uh, smaller communities of Bethpage and Bethany, which were near the Mount of Olives, he, he sends two of his disciples on ahead of him to the next village, probably Clovis, and he told them they'd find a donkey there, all right? And that this donkey would have a young offspring, and they were to bring to him the young offspring, an unbroken donkey. Not the safest thing to normally ride. But Jesus told him to do this because this was a prophecy that was over 800 years old. That Jesus would ride into the city of Jerusalem on an unbroken donkey. The disciples found the donkey and they brought it back to Jesus where some of the disciples threw their coats over the back of that unbroken donkey and they put Jesus on it. And then the procession started on its way to Jerusalem. And I want to pick up reading just a couple of verses. Verses 36, 37, and 38 of Luke 19. As he, referring to Jesus, went along, people now spread their coats on the road in front of him. And when he came near the place where the road goes down to the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples, and, and you've got to understand that word disciples is used very, very loosely here. These are people who have been showing up when Jesus would speak. These are people who were interested in seeing his miracles. And they began to joyfully praise God in loud voices. Notice this. What's the next line say? For all the miracles he had done. They weren't coming to celebrate Jesus because he was God the Son. They were coming to celebrate Jesus that day because he had fed them when they were hungry he had made some of their blind friends see. He had made some of their lame friends walk. He had made some of their deaf friends hear. On a couple of occasions, he had made their dead family members live. And they were excited that he was coming to town because he was a miracle worker. Good thing for you to consider as we approach Easter this year is why would you get excited about Easter? 
Do you get excited about Easter because he's your Santa Claus? Because he's the one you turn to when trouble hits and you think he bails you out? He's your bail bondsman? Or do you love Jesus and do you honor him during this season because he is God the Son? What is the reason for our celebration? You see, these kind of followers, they don't stick. Later in the chapter it says, and many of these disciples followed him no more. When the pressure was on, when life got tough, they bailed on Jesus. But here's the deal. When we treat Jesus badly, he refuses to bail on us. He sticks with us. Palm Sunday, that's next Sunday. By the way, our kids are preparing a wonderful musical, all right, about a 20-minute musical next Sunday, so it'll be great fun. Palm Sunday is the day that Jesus rode that donkey into the city streets. It's, it's also called by some Passion Sunday. Have you ever heard that? Passion Sunday, Passion Week. Do, do you know what the difference between Passover Sunday and Passion Sunday is? Quite frankly, absolutely nothing. Just two names for the same thing, but they do have a little bit of different emphasis. Palm Sunday focuses on the parade of followers that Jesus had as he rode that donkey into the Mount of, from the Mount of Olives into Jerusalem. It focuses on the leafy branches and the coats put on the pathway in front of him. And it's the show of all the people declaring Jesus is king. But you see, they wanted a king like a Caesar. They didn't want a savior of their soul. What kind of king do you want? Passion Sunday focuses on what Jesus went through during this last week of his earthly life, beginning with the adoration and the rejection on Palm Sunday. When we hear the word passion, we tend to think of, of feelings and emotions. For instance, the passion of young love. There's a few of you who can remember that, right? Yeah, the excitement of young love. That's not this word. This word in the Latin, the original meanings, the suffering one goes through. Mel Gibson's movie, now what, 15 years old? The Passion of Christ captured the original meaning of this word. I would like to talk to you today about what starts next Sunday and runs through the following Sunday. And what led to everything then that impacts us now. From Palm Sunday to the betrayal, to the cross, to the resurrection. You see, two weeks from today is the traditional Easter Sunday. It is a time when we acknowledge what Jesus did for us. The taking of our sins away because of his death on the cross. Enduring our punishment that should have been ours so we wouldn't have to. For most of us, we concentrate as much as we can on Easter during Easter. But quickly, the day after Easter, we start thinking about other things. And I want to suggest to you today, we should never take our attention away from the message of Easter, Easter and we should never take our attention away from the cross. We sometimes beautify the cross. We make it into stained glass windows and gold necklaces and silver bracelets. Nothing wrong with that. As long as we remember it is an ugly instrument of death that should have been ours but it's now a gift that frees us from that. We should never, ever forget that. Many people read about the triumphal entry and then they quickly gloss over the cross and they spend the rest of their attention on the empty tomb or the ascension. And it's okay that we do that. But it's very needed that we see the empty tomb and the cross for what they really mean. Let me say this at the beginning. There's nothing more important than the resurrection. Nothing. I'm going to emphasize the cross today, but we understand nothing more important. Nothing more important than the resurrection. It is the resurrection that validates the unique birth of Jesus Christ. It is the resurrection that validates the miraculous life that he lived. It is the resurrection that validates the prophetically painful death that he died. Without the resurrection, his birth would not be special. Without the resurrection, his life and ministry would have been a waste Without the resurrection, the cross 
should have been avoided. But because of the resurrection, all those other things are validated. But it doesn't make them unimportant. His virgin birth, very important. The miracles he performed, very important as they fulfill prophecy. The death he died, very important for us to stay, understand on a daily basis. It is the story of the cross that ties the beginning of sin in the garden and the ending of the penalty of that sin on the cross to make the story complete. It is at the cross where we find the real meaning of the ministry of Jesus while on earth. It is at the cross that we find the real meaning of his love. For God so loved the world that he what? Gave his only begotten son. Give him, to, to give him as a, a unique birth? No. Gave him to a painful death that whosoever will may have everlasting life. It is the reality of the cross that makes possible the practical living of the Christian life. Paul is the one who clarifies with us that we should never ever forget the cross. In light of the resurrection, we should never ever forget the cross. I, I wished I was an artist because somehow I would love to see a picture painted with sunlight coming through an open tomb Casting the shadow of the cross. There's the whole story, folks. I am the light of the world. The tomb is empty. The stone is rolled away. The cross is in the shadow of the light. That's the whole story. We should never get far from any of it. For it is Paul who said, I am crucified with Christ so that it's not I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. That is in the present progressive tense. I am now and every day I should be identifying in the death of Jesus Christ so I'm not allowing my own human nature to control my behavior. I did a wedding right on this stage yesterday. And uh, uh, delightful, delightful couple. Um, uh, oh, mm, but I hate to say middle-aged, but they, they weren't a young couple. They weren't 23, 24. They were, they were in their late 30s and early 40s getting married. He was a dentist. I can't imagine being married to a dentist. <laughs> I'm sorry if you're a dentist. I apologize, but you always hurt me. Um, Anyway, uh, they had made a, uh, after dating for a couple of years, uh, it's coming close to Christmas time. She really hopes he's going to propose, but there's no indications yet. And in fact, there's a little bit of a downer because he said, you know what, let's not buy each other Christmas presents this year. And so he said, let's have breakfast. And so she, she shows up at his house and they're going to have breakfast Christmas morning. And when she gets there, they're going skiing the week after Christmas. He has presents of ski gloves cap, jacket, boots, pants, all wrapped and separate. Now, she admits she's a control freak. This is her own admission. She says, I showed up Christmas morning at his house. He said, no presents. I brought nothing. And I get there, and he's got this couch full of presents. He said, those aren't Christmas presents. They're not under the tree. She's opened each one of them and she's mad and then he, he goes the next step and he adds insult to injury. He makes her go put it all on and model it for him. And then as she comes out, he reaches inside the Christmas tree and he pulls out a box and then he fumbles the box and it lands on the ground and he hits his knee and he looks up and he proposes marriage. She said, I said, I'm not saying yes till you open the box and prove to me there's a ring in there. You see, she felt so out of control that day because he hadn't kept the rules that she wasn't all that goose pimply about the proposal. You see, we like that, that's our biggest problem with admitting we need Jesus as our Savior is we have control issues. We don't want to give up the control of our life to someone else to come live within us. It's why Paul went on to say in the book of Romans, the things that I want to do, I don't do. This battle is going on within me. I want to do this good thing, but I can't do it. And the things I don't want to do that I shouldn't do that get me in trouble, I do do. And that's where we end up. In doo-doo. <laughs> and, 
And then he says, oh, wretched man that I am. And he said, the way to resolve this battle is to die. Identify with the death he died so we can now live the life he offers. So we should never get out of the shadow of the cross. So what I want to do is take these next 15 minutes. I think I can do this. And I just want to try to get Easter imprinted on your mind before we ever get to Easter week. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use every letter in the, word, in the name of Easter. E-A-S-T-E-R, an acrostic. And give you a, a kind of a statement for each one of those letters. So let's jump right in. E for Easter. The first E stands for encouragement that we have been given. All of us need, like, and deeply appreciate encouragement when it comes. I think the perfect example of showing how we all need to be encouraged rather than continually being discouraged is shown in the story of how a little boy wanted to play darts with his dad. And he said, Daddy, I'll throw them. And you just say, good boy. He wanted encouragement. I, I sort of experienced that this past week at, 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 at our son's house with Bo, our grandson. Our grandson said, Grandpa, let's play hide and seek. I said, okay. He said, I'll count. You go hide in my closet and I'll find you. <laughs> See, he wanted to guarantee a win. All right? So he set up the rules to win. Why? Because it makes us all feel much better. Well, yeah, I want you to understand, God has set up the rules so we win. That's why he died on a cross. So we win. It's why he rose from the dead. So we win. In Romans 5.14, Paul says, For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through endurance and the encouragement of Scriptures, we might have hope. Nothing encourages us more than hope. Nothing. 1 Timothy 6.17 says, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put hope in their wealth, which is so uncertain, but put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. These verses tell us that we can be encouraged through the Scriptures and we can have hope in the Lord, but we must remember that the only way we can receive this encouragement and hope is through Jesus Christ if we let Him be our Savior. And that will keep reminding us of what Jesus did for us on the cross. We will have many storms and problems in our lives, and sometimes we feel that there is no way we can make it through those tra tragedies. But God promises us that He will never break a bruised reed, and He won't snuff out a burnt wick. When we feel bruised and burnt, God says, I will get you through it. You see, because of what happened on that Easter Sunday so many years ago, I'll get you through it. If Jesus could move the stone to overcome the grave, then he's powerful enough to move the stones that block us in our lives. But I want you to notice something. That though Jesus prayed the night before his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, that very night, Jesus had prayed, excuse me, that night after his triumphal entry, he prayed, Father, it'd be good if you'd take this away from me. How many times have you prayed for God to take some problem out of your life and you thought he wasn't listening when he didn't? Do you think the father wasn't listening to his son that night in the garden when he prayed? See, what's to be learned about that prayer is not what Jesus prayed, but how God answered. God said no. Did Jesus get mad because the father said no? No. He said, Father, this might be my preference, but your will is my best. And Jesus had to go through betrayal, abuse, embarrassment, crucifixion, and death. But is that where the story ended? No. It ended in resurrection. Resurrection doesn't mean you won't go through the tough stuff, but it means the outcome is as good as it gets. So don't think that by becoming a Christian, you're going to avoid the struggles and the problems of life. You probably will not. What you will avoid is some of the struggles that you would cause yourself. 
But it doesn't mean you'll avoid difficulties in this world. But God said, I've got a better outcome for you if you trust me than you could have if you try to handle all on your own. We need encouragement. God provides it for us in the most unusual ways and circumstances. Somebody once wrote, flatter me and I might not believe you. Criticize me and I might not like you. But encourage me. I'll never stop thinking about you and loving you. We need to encourage others. A stands for the angel who invited the girls, the women, to come and see. When the women went to the tomb, sad and sorrowful, Matthew says the angel told them, go in, look where Jesus has been. And God is inviting you and I to look at the evidence of the life of Jesus, the death of Jesus, and the resurrection of Jesus. He wants us to investigate it. There were over 500 witnesses that saw Jesus after he was raised from the dead. If every one of them showed up here today and I gave them 10 minutes to speak, we would be here for three solid days without a break. If you want to do some investigation on your own, you have not heard enough, you have not seen enough in your lifetime to believe in Jesus, may I recommend two books to you. One entitled, Who Moved the Stone? by Frank Morrison. It was written in the 1930s by a, uh, an investigative journalist who set out to disprove the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And in the concluding three chapters of his book, there's a turn in his attitude and his beliefs. As he looked at the life of Peter and the life of James, the half-brother of Jesus, and the life of Saul of Tarsus, his conclusion was the resurrection must be true or these men could have never done what they did with the rest of their lives after the resurrection of Jesus. If you want something more recent, then read Lee Strobel, an investigative reporter as well who set out to write a book to prove to his wife that her new faith in Jesus Christ was a waste of time. And by the time he got to the end of his research, he is now a pastor. And he wrote a book called The Case for Christ and a much smaller book called The Case for Easter. You can pick him up at Majesty and it would be a great place for you to investigate the truths of the Easter message. The S stands for the surprise of the ages. Have you ever been surprised by God? He's full of surprises. In fact, C.S. Lewis wrote a book with that title full of surprises. I like the story about a professor. You'll recognize his name in a moment when I give you the rest of the story. But I like the story about a professor who sat at his desk one evening working on his next day lecture. His housekeeper had laid that day's mail and papers on his desk and he began to shuffle through them, discarding most of it into the wastebasket. He then noticed a magazine. It wasn't even addressed to him. It had been delivered to his office by mistake. But as he laid it down, it fell open to a particular article that was entitled, The Needs of the Congo Mission. I don't know about you, but that's not all that tantalizing of a title. But casually, this professor began to read that article when he was suddenly consumed by the words that said, Our need is great. We have no one to work the northern province of Gabon in central Congo. It is my prayer that as I write this article, God will lay his hand on one. One on whom already the master's eyes have been cast. That he or she shall be called to this place to help us. The professor's name was Albert Schweitzer. He closed that magazine and he wrote in his diary that day, My search is over. And he gave himself for the rest of his life to the Congo. That little article hidden in a periodical intended for somebody else placed by accident in Schweitzer's mailbox. By chance he noticed the title, the title and it leaped out at him. Chance? Luck? Right? <laughs> one of God's surprises. This season we focus on one of the greatest surprises there ever has been. The surprise that took place when an angel appeared to a group of grieving women mourning a dead friend and relative. And the angel said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Everyone was caught off guard by the resurrection. The soldiers fainted. The Pharisees came up with a lie to cover their story. And Jesus Christ rose victorious over sin, death, hell, and the grave. And that's been the greatest surprise on earth. And the earth has never recovered since then. Thank God. 
T stands for telling others. And that's what the whole first three months of our sermon series has been all about. You and I becoming bold enough, courageous enough, willing enough, obedient enough to simply share our faith with those that God puts in front of us. I'm not asking anybody to go to Africa yet. That's next February. <laughs> or the following one. But what I am asking you to do is the scripture says look out into the fields. Look right in front of you. Share this incredible event that happened 2,000 years ago that became personal to you at some moment in time. And you are now a believer in Jesus Christ. You're a Christian, not a Baptist, not a Presbyterian, not a New Hopian. You can be any one or all of those things and die and go to a Christless eternity. It's not about religion. I've said that so many times in my life that I've thought I need to quit saying that. People are getting, you know, bored with hearing it's not about religion. It's about a relationship. I had three people at Ron Cross's surgery come up and say, I have never heard, I have been so mad at God. I've been so mad at religion. I've never heard anybody say that. I just might come to your church. <laughs> wow. So don't come to my church. Come to my Jesus. He is the one who makes the difference. And somehow we've got to be. And you know, I talk really bold up here. And I'm speaking to you. But I get just as scared out there to boldly proclaim the name of Jesus to neighbors and family members and strangers. I'm just as terrified as any one of you. You know why? Because I like to be liked. I don't know if you battle with that at all, but I really do. I, if you tell me you don't like me, I don't like that. <laughs> and so sometimes, sometimes, did you discipline your kids even when they didn't like you? You should have. Sometimes you and I need to do the hard things even running the risk of not being liked. I've concluded in recent weeks that we often decide that our comfort means more to us than Christ's command. We don't want people to think bad of us, and so we don't follow his command to share the good news. All the while we come to church and sing an old hymn, I have decided to follow Jesus. Here's what Christians have done to Christianity over the years. The first thing we've done is we've softened the truth so we don't offend anybody when they hear it. I, I do my best to say an offensive truth in an unoffensive way. But what we have to be careful not to do is to change the truth because the Bible says that the truth of the good news is an offense to those who don't want to hear it. We can't take the offense out of the fact that we are sinners in need of a Savior. The E, the second, uh, nah, we, we need to, do you know how the, do you know how 95% of the people have come to know Jesus Christ? Because somebody invited him to church. So if you can't find the courage to point blank ask somebody, do you know Jesus personally? Why don't you say, why don't you come to church with me and find out why it's so important for me? Then let somebody else tell them. And you just pray. But 95% of the folks who have a relationship with Jesus Christ found out about Jesus in church. Invite folks to come with you. I, short story. Dennis Fanning, and most of you in here don't know him. Unless you grew up in Clovis. He played football at Clovis High back in the 70s. His brother lives just down the street from here. Um, block and a half. But this goes back to when I just started pastoring the church that dad had started in Fresno. So we're now talking uh, 30 plus years ago. 35. A couple, I grew up, no, I get back up and tell the story right. A young lady came to church on a Sunday with her husband, and she and I had been in church together as little kids when dad pastored the church he started in Clovis. Her older brother and I, his birthday was one day before mine. 
I remember all this stuff. I had not seen her in probably 20 years. She, I didn't know she was married. Didn't know she was old enough to be married. She and her husband show up and they've got a friend with them. This is her first time in church. And she says to me, Tim, she said, this is our friend Dennis. He really needs to be in church. His wife left him. She had had an affair. She's left him. Blindsided him. He's a mess. This is this couple's first time at church bringing their friend. The next week, actually, not just the next week, I've never seen that couple again. 35 years later, I've never seen them again. But they brought Dennis to church. Dennis came back the next week and the next week and the fourth week he gave his, Christ, he gave his life to Jesus Christ. And a year later, he met a girl at an insurance company. Met a woman at an insurance company. Her name was Paula. Found out they had a mutual friend. That mutual friend set them up on a blind date. Listen to what Dennis said on a blind date. He looked at Paula after the evening was about over and he said, I think you're a really nice person. He said, I'd like to date you again. But he said, Jesus Christ is the most important relationship I have in my life. And if that's not important to you, there's no reason for us to waste our time. <laughs> I looked at him when he told me this story. And I said, Dennis, I'm not sure I could have done that. And he said, well, it's just where I am right now, man. I, I've messed up. I don't want to go there again. And, and, and her response was classic. Paula looked at him and said, Dennis, I've been raised Catholic. And I don't know, I know the Jesus that you're talking about. But I would be interested in finding out. And he said, okay, our church service is at 11 o'clock on Sunday morning. See you there. He didn't even offer to pick her up. <laughs> For three months, she had to drive herself. I was about two months in. I said, Do you guys don't ever come to church. She said, no. He told me if I wanted to come, I had to drive myself. He wanted to find out if I was serious. And three months later, in the first home Bible study, small group, we didn't call them small group back then, but the first Bible study ever done in my own home, about six weeks in, Paula gave her life to Jesus Christ. It started with somebody inviting somebody who invited somebody to church, and people got saved. Folks, you and I need to tell others. The E, second E, stands for excitement. Out of the mouths of babes. Do you remember the little cartoon, Family Circus? Little Bill and his brother are walking through a store looking at all the Easter eggs and candy. And he says, this may be Good Friday, but Sunday's going to be even gooder. <laughs> Bad English, but really profound, profound. We ought to be excited. What the difference a day makes. Imagine how bad all those women felt on Saturday. And on Sunday at the tomb, everything changed. The angel said, come and see. Come and see. And Jesus says to you today, come and see all that I've done for you. And the R stands for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Confucius is still in the grave. Buddha is still in his grave. Muhammad is still in his grave. Joseph Smith is still in his grave. It is only Christianity that has a living Savior in God, and he will be alive forever. I've told it before, but I love it. A Sunday school teacher had just finished telling her third graders about how Jesus was crucified, placed in the tomb, a big stone put over the opening, and then wanting the excitement of the resurrection to be shared with the kids, the teacher said, and what do you think Jesus' first words out of the tomb were? And a little girl in the back said, I know, I know. And the teacher called it out. And she goes, ta-da! <laughs> and I love that little girl. I love that little girl. <laughs> you and I need to learn how to say with excitement, ta-da! <laughs> Why? Because the resurrection is that exciting. Let me close with this story. Many of you have probably heard the name K. Arthur, right? If you haven't, uh, she's a woman teacher and author. She's just terrific. In fact, she has a study Bible out with her name on it, all right? She's, she's really in-depth, an inductive form of doing Bible study. Many people would probably think she became a Christian at a young age and has walked with Jesus her entire life. Let me share with you briefly her story as she wrote it in her book, Lord, I need your grace because I can't make it on my own. 
In there she talks about her struggles in her life and coming to know Jesus. She said, as a young girl I went to church, but I never committed my life to him. I grew up and I got married and then I found out that my husband suffered from some pretty serious mental disorders. We had two children, but our marriage was always in trouble. My husband was constantly causing problems and I finally left him. Time after time he called and pleaded with me to come back and I refused and finally he threatened to kill himself. And I told him, go ahead, I need the insurance money. <laughs> and he did. In her remorse, Kay Arthur says she can remember driving from the funeral, shaking her fist at God and saying, go to hell. God. And she writes, it was like somebody flipped a switch right then. I suddenly realized that at the cross, that was exactly what God had done. He went to hell for me that I might go to heaven with him. That is what he's done for you. And if you've never accepted that, you could do that in the quietness of this moment as we wrap up in prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you for going to hell on a cross for me so that I can go to heaven with you. I'm tired of being the one who's always in control. I'm ready to turn my life over to you. I might not be able to avoid the betrayal of others and the abuse from others. And I might not even be able to avoid death in my own life, but I know that it ends in a resurrection story. Heaven is mine forever. Let's pray. Father, I love you. I'm grateful for the story of Easter. Without it, without it, I'd be jobless. Without it, we'd all be most miserable. Without it, we would have no source of hope to offer to ourselves or even to others about the challenges, frustrations, and aggravations this life and our own stupidity bring. But Father, you offer to us a way of escape. It is not complicated, it is simple. But it isn't easy, it's hard. Because none of us like to admit that we are sinners in need of a Savior. But when we can come to a point that we can admit exactly what we are, we get to say, ta-da! And enjoy the excitement of a resurrected life. Thank you for hearing all of our prayers. And particularly those this morning where somebody is inviting you to come live in their life. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day.